Have you ever had a case with Spring Security when you try to copy paste some code, but it didn't work? You spend hours trying to figure out what the issue is, but there are just so many things involved. Finally, once you solve the issue, you hope to never go back to this again because you are not sure what just happened. By the end of this video, my goal is to give you a better understanding why Spring Security has so many parts, how do they work, and the most important why each one of them is needed. So the next time when you're going to make a change, you'll have a complete sense of what just happened. Let's dive into it. Before I move on, make sure to stick around till the end of the video because I will share a trick that will show you what happens at every step of Spring Security when it tries to authorize a user. The good place to start is to add Spring Security to our application. First thing to notice is it's going to block all requests. It's also going to apply a certain configuration structure of the components that we're about to explore. Part of that structure is a login page and set of default credentials with a username such as user and password that we can see in our console. Even though you're less likely to use it in production, it's a great set of defaults to start our journey. Once we enter our credentials, the request is going to be sent and will go through a series of filters. There are many filters pre-configured, but the ones we're interested in belong to the category of security filters. If you heard the term security filter chain, that is it, a collection of security filters. If I inspect my application, I can see multiple security filters, but the one I'm going to focus on is username password authentication filter. It is responsible for processing credentials from the form on the login page. In fact, we can use any other form as long as we supply username and password and send a post request to the login endpoint. Let me talk about username and password for a second. So Spring generated username and password for us, so it's going to use its internal mechanism to verify those. However, there are a handful of other scenarios how username and password can be stored and verified. For example, using a database with a custom scheme, we can also use OAuth tool and OpenID Connect mechanism, LDAP, or any other custom authentication scheme that you can think of. So the question is, should Spring add all those mechanisms to each filter that is performing authentication? To support those various mechanisms of authentication, Spring uses the concept of authentication provider. Each implementation of the provider is responsible for performing its own type of authentication. For demonstration purposes, I only highlighted a few of those, but there are much more available from Spring out of the box. However, there are two questions that come up. How do we know which provider to choose and how do we tell each filter about all the providers that we have? To address those two problems, Spring actually has something called Authentication Manager. It sits right in between filters and providers. Authentication Manager is an interface and its most common implementation is Provider Manager. Provider Manager goes through all providers and checks which one supports specific authentication strategy. It is possible because each provider implements supports method. So our manager takes all the providers, uses a basic for loop to iterate through all of them and finds the one which it can use. In our specific scenario, DAO authentication provider is being used. It's one of the most commonly utilized providers and a default choice to authenticate against databases, other persistent stores, or like in our case, in memory store. At this point, we can say that everything worked just fine. But let's imagine DAO authentication provider needs to load users from one data source, for example, locally for testing, and have another data source in production, like a real database. What if we have our own custom schema that is different from the one that Spring provides? Should we extend DAO authentication provider and add our own custom logic? In the end, all authentication checks are the same, but the place where the user is stored are different. Turns out Spring Security has a better solution for this, and it's called User Details Service. It's an interface with just one method on it, log by username, which, as you probably guessed, is used to load a user from a user store. It does return a user details object that represents a user with all the fields on it, which our provider can use to verify a user. However, I think we missed one of the important part here. Most of the time, passwords are never stored in clear text in a database, but instead they're hashed. They're going through a specific mathematical operation that is produces a result that is irreversible. So in a case there got stolen, a hacker can't use them anyway. So the question is, how do we compare hashed password that is stored in the database with a clear password that was sent in the request? And the answer is through the use of password encoder. Password encoder is added to authentication provider and it is used to produce a hash 
from the clear password that was sent in the request. Then later, it will be compared to the one that we have in the database, and if those match, the authentication will be successful. Once the provider is done, it returns authentication object, which is very similar to the user details, but with a couple of fields changed. Since all the heavy lifting was already done by the provider, we only need to know whether the user is authenticated. There is also no password field, as we don't want to have it exposed longer than necessary, even if it's hashed. Now we have authentication object that is going to be returned back to authentication manager and then back to the filter. Since we now have successfully authenticated a user, we need to store it somewhere so the other parts of the code can access it as well. For example, to fetch a username to show a greeting, check the age, so on and so forth. And of course, Spring has a solution for it, and it's called security context. Once authentication object was returned back to the filter, the filter will add a currently authenticated user to a security context. Another word for the currently authenticated user is principal. In order to access principal, Spring uses a wrapper around security context, which is called security context holder. It does have a static get context method on it, which we can call to retrieve a principal. And because it's static, we can call it from any part of the code base without necessarily passing parameters to any other methods. That is pretty much concludes one of the most common authentication scenarios out there. However, you may have a question, what about subsequent requests? And there are multiple scenarios. For example, if we don't use a session and use something like basic authentication, then we'll have to go through this flow every time that we send a request. On the contrary, if we do use a session, once the user authenticated, Spring will use its internal mechanism to associate the user with the session. So the next time when the request comes, there is a special filter called security context holder filter, which will try to load our user from the session. And if succeeded, then the user doesn't have to re-authenticate. Another scenario is when we're using JWTs. Since all the information about the user is included inside the JWT. Those are a scalable and stateless form of authentication where we don't have to go to database or any other store to verify a user. We only need to check the signature and if it matches, then we can say that the user is authenticated. It is something that I'm going to explore in more details in the next video. The next point I would like to discuss is what happens if we have an error? What if we can't find the user or password doesn't match or we just simply can't authenticate? If that happens, Spring has a special type of filter called Exception Translation Filter. That filter is responsible for catching all the authentication and authorization exceptions and returning, depending on configuration, 401 or 403 error to the client. Another question you might have is why we have so many security filters. Some of them are focusing on protection, such as CSRF filter. Some of them add login logout page, but the ones we are looked at are type of authentication filters. They're easy to differentiate because they end with authentication filter name. So you might ask, why do we need to have multiple authentication filters? Well, it turns out that we can have multiple ways to send username and password. If you think about the login form example that we used in our scenario, we send username and password to the server using special fields and content type of form URL encoded. If we use basic authentication filter, Username and password are usually base64 encoded and sent via the header or at the part of the URL. Regardless of the authentication filter, all of them need to have a unified way to send those credentials to authentication manager that will further authenticate the request. So their job is to extract username and password from the request and create something called authentication token. So in our case, Spring created username password authentication token and send it to provider manager. Overall, this is just a standard out of the box authentication. There are a lot of variations available to it. For example, it's very common to implement a custom JWT filter, which doesn't use manager and providers. But in the case of JWT, in most of the time, Spring has already a solution for us where we just need to tweak a couple of parts. As we can see, Spring Security has many components because it is so flexible and allows us to change only small part that we need instead of changing or implementing the entire configuration. Early in the video, I told you that I'm going to share a trick that will show you what happens at each stage when Spring Security is trying to authorize a user. That trick is to add a trace and logger level for a Spring Security package. So if I'm going to turn into my application YAML file and add the trace and login level and then run it, then I'm going to take this password and try to hit any endpoint I will use the username of user and password, then I just copy it. I will hit sign in. We can see I got a 
error page because I don't have a controller here, but authentication was successful. If I go to the console, I can see that at every step of the process, we have Spring Security showing us which filter was invoked. So we have CSRF filter, we have logout filter, and at some point we do have username and password authentication filter. Then it reached out to provider manager, which selected our DAO authentication provider, which successfully authenticated a user. Later, our username and password authentication filter put authenticated user into security context right here. So you can add a trace and login level to your application, play with it locally, and see what kind of authentication steps your application is going through. That'll be it for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.